recording emailed to you, you can email me or contact me. This is Carrie Ballion. Um, and you can contact me at gbys at choicesforparents.org. Um, and I think we're ready for Nancy. Nancy Carrie? Scott, are you here? Yes, but before you start recording, or have you already started? Okay, well, I'm going to pause it because I did start. So I'm going to start the recording again. Here we go. Now, I cannot do Nancy justice with any type of introduction. She has been around in our field um, for as long as I have been in this journey, um, which is going on, or is in a, it's 11th year now. <laughs> um, and I'm sure Nancy could fill us in more about what she's currently doing and what, where her background lies. So, Nancy, would you mind sharing? Uh, not at all. My name is Nancy Scott, and yes, I'm older than Dirk. <laughs> that's, that's a given. So, um, but to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I am an educator who majored in deaf education and worked at the Illinois School for the Deaf in Jacksonville for 31 years. Over the course of that time, I taught a whole bunch of different stuff. <laughs> Um, starting with middle school sex ed, and then quickly moved from that into uh, the elementary rhythm program, and I'm going to be talking about that a little bit tonight. And then that was expanded into the junior high and high school music and dance program. Altogether, I did those things for 18 years. And then I was moved part time into the parent infant program and started working on early intervention. And I did that as well uh, for 18 years, so those were overlapping a little bit. The last 11 years, I worked for a program called Hearing and Vision Connection, and it's the training and technical assistance program for the Bureau of Early Intervention specific to infants and toddlers with vision and hearing concerns. I retired a year and a half ago, and now I just come back to play a little bit here and there. Um, happy to have my brain picked with any information that I might be able to share that's going to help someone along the way. Um, I also have a background in interpreting. I prefer to do most of that related to music and theater. Um, that's a passion of mine, and I've spent a lot of time combining the music and dance and theater with working with individuals with hearing loss. I also um, work at two group homes that are for adults who are deaf and developmentally delayed. So I've worked with Itty Bitty. I've worked with School Age 3 to 21. I do some outreach at the college level. And I've worked with adults. So a little bit here, a little bit there, have worn a variety of hats over the course of my experiences. And I hope that um, something I have to say tonight might be helpful to you. At the same time, if you're interested in getting a hold of me later um, with any other questions once our time is up, you can do that by contacting me through um, the state. And that's simply... Um, my first name, dot last name, at Illinois.gov. So Nancy, N-A-N-C-Y, dot S-C-O-T-T, dot Illinois, spell it out, dot G-O-V. And just an FYI, anybody that works for the state, that's how you do it. First name, dot last name, at Illinois.gov. Um, and they converted everybody's email to do that. Uh, I don't work all the time. I'm not in the office every day. I do check my email several times a week. So, so um, I will attempt to get back to you and answer whatever questions you may have. So that all being said, let's talk about this music thing, shall we? Um, there are two main reasons that I, that I enjoy sharing this. One, because music and dance and theater was a passion of mine um, before I got into the field of deafness. And the opportunity to be able to merge those two was a wonderful opportunity for me. And to walk 
children and what their experiences were um, blew every expectation I ever had. Um, and that was before I even knew for sure why I was doing what I was doing. I just knew it was making a difference. Nowadays, there's all kinds of research out there. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, are much more tech savvy than I, but you can look up and filter through and find all kinds of fascinating things that are being done these days in the field of music with um, individuals that are deaf, hard of hearing, implanted, that use sign language, that use hearing, that use speech. Um, and so many fascinating things are being found. But the one thing we really are focusing in on these days with many of the research projects is how happy music makes the brain. The brain is a very, very um, complex organ, but it likes music. And introducing music and rhythmic activities um, auditorily as well as body movement-wise helps the brain get in sync, helps the brain to be able to run, remember things better, it stores things in a more clear pattern, and it allows for improved cognition or thinking skills. So all those things that we were doing for a long, long time, um, we're doing a lot more than just the kinds of things that we were doing. We own our school for the deaf actually was the first um, school in the country to start offering music for children that were deaf and hard of hearing. It's been over 100 years that Illinois has had such a program, and it's included a variety of different things through the years. Um, but once upon a time, there was a marching band. Um, they had a fine choir. We've had extensive dance programs. We've had instrument lessons, lots and lots and lots of things. Originally, it was started out to improve speech. The idea that speech has a rhythm and a pattern, and if we can get a rhythmic pattern um, in a rhythmic sense into the children, it would improve the rhythmic pattern of their speech. So that's how it started, like I said, over 100 years ago. And then it branched out into all kinds of interesting things. Um, what I would like to share with you tonight are um, some of the key things that we focused on in the program, both when I was working with babies in the home, as well as when I was working with the elementary, junior high, and high school students. Um, from what you've told me, we've got several that are infant, itty bitty, and then we have three, four, five-year-olds. So we kind of have two little clusters here. I will try to um, direct some of my comments and look at those age groups. Um, but the goals that I think are pretty common goals um, for all of you would be that you want your children to acquire language and expand vocabulary. You want your children to improve their communication skills. Uh, we want to develop good body awareness and coordination. We want to um, develop positive self-esteem. And then a fifth area of which is something that I personally felt helped this whole process was a, an understanding of music. And so I'm going to talk about um, those areas and what we did and how we did it and why we did it so that you can get some ideas of things to do with your children. And that's where we're all going. Um, we want to come up with some things that are going to help you interact with your child in such a way that will keep the brain happy and at the same time improve some of these other things. So when it comes to language and vocabulary, the world is full of words. Um, and it doesn't matter to me or to um, anyone else what language you are using, what mode you are using. You can be signing, you can be queuing, you can be using your speech. You can use English, Spanish, French, Polish. I don't care what languages you use. You can use as many of them as you'd like. 
Um, but the idea is to include rhythmic events and activities, sing songs, fun things um, with your child. And like I said, whether you sing it, whether you sign it, um, whether you beat it out with a drum um, to get that pattern going and then introduce the vocabulary, um, you can do that. I would hope that every family that's represented on this call tonight has music in their lives in some way, shape, or form, whether it's family favorites that you learned growing up as a child, whether you sing in the church choir, whether you play drums in your high school um, jazz band, whatever it may be, um, or maybe you enjoy listening to music on um, the radio or through your stereos or whatever mode that is, I would hope that you all have some type of music in your lives. And to share that with your children is a, a huge thing. Um, the, the family that comes to mind uh, whenever I talk about music is uh, parents who were both professors of music at the college level whose son was born profoundly deaf. And they were devastated um, because their true life's passion was music. And they were afraid that they would not be able to include their son in what was such a, um, an important part of their life. And they soon, soon learned that absolutely he could be involved across the board in attending concerts and playing instruments and um, developing that love and appreciation for music just as, as they had. So um, I want you to start thinking right now of where music is apparent in your life. Maybe it's listening to the radio when you drive in the car. Um, but whatever it is, I want you to start thinking about those times, and then we're going to talk about how you can make your child um, an active participant in that as well. So with that vocabulary and language push that we want, um, we want to come up with some, some music patterns that we're going to use and repeat them again and again and again. Make up a song about changing diapers for those of you that have little ones. And every time you change the diaper, let's talk. Whether your child is hearing all those words, whether your child is hearing the inflection in the voice, whether your child is lip reading, um, as he's watching you, all of those are a-okay, fine ways for that to happen. If you want to sign or, or cue along with that, um, but start to have some repetitive things when it's time to eat, when it's time to get ready for bed, at bath time. Start thinking about some of those daily routines and make up a little song about it, whether it's to the tune of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star or Mary Had a Little Lamb. Um, these are ways to introduce um, repetitive vocabulary and at the same time, put it into a musical format which makes your brain happy and helps it remember. Um, so think about that. And I do want to encourage anyone who may be bilingual, trilingual um, by heritage, please um, share with your child songs in your um, native language if there are any families that that applies to. Um, lots and lots of opportunities and switching back and forth between languages is an okay thing too. It may be code switching if you're going from signing to speech or it may be language switching if you're going from um, English to Spanish, for example. Uh, but both of those are, are very good opportunities to use that same repetitive rhythmic pattern and switch from signing it to singing it. Um, and your child will appreciate the opportunity to switch back and forth and to start to recognize that um, they can switch back and forth between two modes or two languages.
but the message is the same in both of those ways. So um, expanding language and vocabulary is a big, 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 big deal. Um, when we talk about communication skills, we're talking the facial expressions and body language and speech and speech reading and all of those different modalities. Um, those are all kind of the precursor things before we start using them as formal language skills. The vocal play that we can do from making high tones to low tones and nasal tones and guttural tones and um, getting your child to produce those um, vocalizations is a, is a lot of imitation and patterning, and um, but it's always fun to turn it into a game. And if you use rhythm behind it um, and music, that makes it all the more fun. So keep in mind, uh, when you start doing things throughout your day with your children, that you can switch from doing some vocal play to doing some fine motor things with the hands to listening to the repetitive pattern of different um, opportunities in their environment. And with those of you that have the younger children, you may not have focused in on one or two particular modes. You may still be um, trying to identify what modes are the um, best avenue for your child to receive and express information. And through musical rhythmic activities, you'll begin to see right away um, what modalities are being most successful because it's a fun and enjoyable thing and they will start to repeat those things. Um, and then you will know that that's a successful way for your child um, to, to access information or to express themselves. Um, some of, the, some of the things just to get started, for those of you that have three, four, five-year-olds, um, fun things like getting them to use their body and uh, body language movement. Uh, animal charades is one thing that's always a lot of fun. Walk like an elephant, big, slow, heavy steps in a rhythm pattern, um, as opposed to a bird that flips and flies and flies around and waves and moves and, and then can, oh, wait, soar, and changing up the rhythm and the pattern um, of them and getting them to start moving their bodies because that's the other thing that we have learned through the years is coordinated rhythmic body movements also make the brain happy. So listening to rhythm patterns and musical um, things helps the brain, and so does moving rhythmically um, helps the brain. So we want to do those things. Uh, one of the ways that we can do that is to create certain rhythm patterns that then when you hear that particular pattern, that's when we're going to hop like a frog or we are going to um, gallop like a horse. And you should have them listen to that rhythm pattern and then, okay, here we go, gallop, 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 gallop. Um, so those are just a few examples of things to get their, their body moving. Um, working on speech things, you may start with just um, using their voice and not using their voice. Um, vocalizing versus not vocalizing. Breath control, um, doing a long, sustained uh, Ah, uh, as opposed to a short, broken, e, 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 and having them imitate and feel those changes. And if you're wondering about using tactile things, sometimes with the kids it's a great opportunity to do that. Have them feel your chest, feel the vibrations when you vocalize, you will feel that um, in your chest. And that's a way to make sure that your children um, voices will stay in the appropriate vocal lanes. We don't want them kicking up into the nasal cavity, and so tactically they can feel that. Have them feel your chest, know when you're talking, and then have them feel their chest, know when they're talking, and singing, and making those fun patterns. Um, so that's some ideas for the facial expressions, playing games in the mirror, listening, and rhythmically 
being happy, being sad, being happy, being sad, changing our facial expressions. Again, another way that they're going to communicate, um, set up a rhythm pattern, develop the ability to imitate and to change. And if your children are finers, then those facial expressions are going to be real key um, in assisting with the communication skills. So those are just a few of the ideas of um, introducing communication modalities into the rhythmic patterns of using music. Um, we talked about body awareness and knowing our right and our left and our front and our back uh, as ways of learning where we are in space and then developing that ability to move. Kids nowadays see so much movement and activity rhythmically um, on Um, and on, t on television, and they can imitate those movements and those patterns. And um, the YouTube is full of children dancing their little hearts out, and your kids can do that as well, um, watching and moving and building the coordination to get arms and legs and head and hips all going and moving. And it's fun. And it may be a little bit, some, some parents are like, oh, I can do that. Well, it's in the privacy of your own home, in your own living room, or your own child's bedroom, and have at it. Have a good time, have fun, and um, wiggle and squirm and move and encourage your child to participate and do the same thing. And you be the leader and then let them be the leader and imitate and follow and get that body movement um, going along. As far as listening to music, if your child is having a difficulty listening to a CD player that you have going with children's songs, um, have them put their hand on the speaker and help tap out for them the rhythm of the music um, that's playing so that they can start to feel that beat um, and encourage them to move and vocalize uh, to that particular um, rhythm that they may be may be hearing. And that's that's one of the reasons that we may start with just introducing that beat, having them clap their hands or pound the wooden spoon on top of the um, turned over uh, metal pot. But to get that sense and that feeling of that rhythmic um, beat that is going on. And then um, I do like to include some musical understanding um, whenever I'm interacting with kids. You want to tell them the names of the instruments that you may have. If you make a homemade tambourine, um, tell them it's a tambourine. If you see on TV um, someone playing a guitar, give them the, those words. Tell them that that's a guitar, that's a concert, um, that's a choir when people are using their voices to make music. Use um, vocabulary that's going to help them develop a little bit of an understanding um, about music. And some, many of the kids that I worked with over the years wanted to learn to play instruments. And m more so than just your little rhythm band that you may have. And many of the students learned to play um, drums, guitars, uh, the piano, um, the uh, electric keyboards. The instruments that were most successful for them were the lower, louder instruments. Um, we used an upright bass. We used electrical guitars that they could sit on speakers and feel the vibrations of what they were playing. Any wooden instrument will give off those vibrations, um, a violin, a guitar, um, that's held against um, their stomach. They can feel um, what they're playing. Piano. Um, I had many of the kids start out playing things an octave or two below where it was actually written. We didn't use middle C. We used two Cs below middle C um, because those were lower and louder tones, easier for the kids um, to hear. So if you have any instruments in your home, um, by all means, use them. 
and encourage your child to explore and experiment with them and see what they can um, hear or, or feel. And it doesn't matter if it's going in auditorily or tactily. We want them to experience it, and um, that will help enhance their uh, ability to appreciate it, too, if they understand um, a little bit more about the instruments and how they work. So things that vibrate, things that um, have a, a, a lower tone will typically uh, be something that will be uh, more appreciated by your children. And they can eventually tell you, I like to listen to this, I don't like to listen to this. We have preferences, whether it's liking country or rock or opera or whatever your interest may be in music. The kids can develop those interests too. Most of the time they're going to choose things with a good heavy beat um, and with lower Tones because, again, those are things that they are going to be able to hear um, a little bit better. Probably my, my most favorite thing to see is um, to see kids get to where they spontaneously on their own will start to sing a song, sign a song, tap their foot to a, a music being played in the background, or to start to dance because the music on the commercial on the TV came on and they felt it in their bones and had to get up and, and, and move. That's that self-expression piece that I was talking about, that self-esteem piece, letting kids express themselves and feel good about their ability to do that, um, to sing, to sign, to dance, to move, to perform. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And again, through the years, because I saw hundreds and hundreds of kids, some of the children that were outstanding when it came to interpreting a song in sign or learning to play an instrument, maybe they weren't the best mathematicians and they had a hard time remembering the geography, um, names, of, names of the states or capitals, but this was an area that they really could shine and have um, a positive experience with and feel uh, good about themselves. So I never underestimate um, what the kids can do. You'd be amazed at um, what they can produce if we give them half the chance to do so. So do not limit what you do with your kids because, oh, gee, their ears don't quite work the same as everybody else's they still can explore and experience and enjoy the opportunity of, of music and dance. So think of things that are fun. Think of things that you like to do that you can share with them and show them how much fun it all is. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be fancy. It's quality time. You with the little bitty ones, just to dance um, holding them and letting them feel the rhythmic movement that you um, are producing, swaying back and forth. We do that to lull infants to sleep all the time. That rhythmic pattern is comforting to them. But we don't always have to be smooth and gentle, you know. We can do a little rock and roll in there, too. And the kids enjoy um, that interaction with you, especially if they can see that you're enjoying it. Um, dancing with stuffed animals. Rolling... Um, a ball back and forth rhythmically, using ribbons, hair ribbons, to um, wave through the air to match um, the pattern of the music that's happening. Um, jump ropes and bean bags and um, things like that are all activities that we can pass around in the, uh, amongst family members, pass back and forth um, between siblings and do it rhythmically um, to the music that's playing. Um, musical chairs. We listen for the music. When the music stops, even if we're not using chairs, we sit down. And then when we hear the music, we play or freeze. Um, we're dancing and swaying around. And when the music stops, everyone stops. That helps um, develop that auditory awareness. We're listening and feeling for the, the sound of the music. Um, and it's a fun game to play. And the kids like to do it. 
as far as the instrument goes, like I said, whether you have formal instruments or you make musical instruments, the kitchen is a great place to find stuff that's noisy. Um, whisks make a good uh, instrument inside of a metal bowl. Um, but there are lots of things, even to put um, beans inside a Tupperware container. And when you shake them, uh, they make a noise inside a coffee can. Um, the new plastic coffee cans make great hand drums, too. Uh, so any anything you can come up with that will uh, create an instrument that they can participate with and follow along with are all great um, things that you can share with your child and share with the siblings and get them going. Now, technology is just phenomenal these days. Um, we've got every kind of system that there is, and whether your child uses hearing aids or implants, um, you can tactilely hook them, um, have them feeling sound systems from music using an FM system, those that are at school age, uh, encouraging them to participate in the school music program that's going on in your school. I've I've had so many calls from public school teachers that uh, said, well, no, it's music class. We don't have the children with hearing loss participate in music class. And I strongly encourage them to say, yes, please do. They may not participate to the same level um, or in the same aspect, but having that opportunity is uh, a, a very, very, very uh, important piece of um, their education, and so we want them to be involved. Uh, even using balloons yeah, for the vibrations, take a balloon and blow it up, hold it gently in your hand, and when you turn on the music, you will feel the, the rhythmic vibrations of um, that music through the balloon. Uh, we've taken kids to concerts and had them hold the balloons to feel and follow the rhythmic beat of the different instruments that are playing. Um, you can go high tech, you can go low tech. Uh, whatever is going to work for your child, I don't know if any of you have seen, but there are even musical chairs where the speakers are in the seat in the back of um, what looks like maybe an office chair. I, uh, I'm trying to think of it. It's a padded chair that has a speaker in the seat and a speaker in the back so that it gives you the vibration as you play whatever music you want to. Um, we've got a couple of them at uh, the School for the Deaf in Jacksonville. And the kids love sitting in that chair and feeling those vibrations and getting that rhythmic beat before they decide they're going to go dance and do a little boogie or make their own uh, song up to go with the rhythm um, of, of the music. So those are some real fancy tech kinds of things, but like I said, you can go low tech with the balloons too. Um, look for opportunities within the community. Don't, don't hesitate to say, oh, well, I can't take my child to this or to that. Yes, absolutely you can. Um, I know there are lots of uh, toddler music programs. And I would encourage you um, to explore or seek those out for your child. I, I know even in a small town like Jacksonville, we have two or three different folks who run weekly classes for um, toddlers. And the kids just have a ball. And each song they learn, they learn the pattern of that song. And it may be that this song, everybody gets a tambourine, and we play along with this song. And then the next song, everybody gets a scarf, and we dance and wave the scarf so that it goes from one to the next, and it becomes a repetitive pattern. Um, and they learn and develop the motor and the auditory skills to go with that. The programs themselves are designed for hearing children. But we have had many children with hearing loss participate in those groups and do outstanding. So I would encourage you to um, see what's available in your community and encourage your children to be involved. 
um, take them to the concerts in the park. You're probably coming on to uh, winter time here, but next spring I know lots of communities that have um, concerts and programs in their in their parks and take your child and let them have that opportunity um, to explore and, and see what that's all about. And again, encourage them to move and dance along to what they hear and what they feel. The opportunity for you to access uh, music itself, if you don't have a lot of uh, music in your repertoire, your public libraries have, um, all of them, I believe, have um, CDs that are available that you can check out and you want to find some children's music as well as some classical kinds of things, like I said, giving them the opportunity to listen to lots of different things um, is a good thing, but you can get things from the library. Um, you can borrow um, children's musical um, CDs or DVDs from your video rental places. Um, many times for those that are using signs, um, most of what she does has uh, a music base to it, so she goes through learning the songs and teaching the signs, and the kids are moving and dancing and laughing, and that's another um, great interactive way to uh, get your child involved. If your child is receiving services from speech packs or OTs or PTs, um, even asking them to in incorporate some music into the speech things or the motor skills that they are working on with your child um, to do it in such a way that we can include some music in there makes it more fun and um, we're killing two birds with one stone there, so to speak. So giving them again that opportunity. This one, your children that are old, over three that are in schools, I would encourage you to um, request that they do participate in whatever music um, and PE activity programs are available and not to have your child excluded, which for some reason people kind of think that they should do that. Um, but there's lots of things out there. There are lots of companies that have um, resources that you can purchase, but I wouldn't start out there. I would start out singing yourself, listening to the radio, um, just taking the times of day that you have music in your life and in including making sure that your child is included in those experiences. Um, at this point, I want to stop and um, see what kinds of questions you may have or what scenarios you might typically have in your home and if you would like some ideas or suggestions of how to start to incorporate um, your child into some of those opportunities. So I have no idea how to do this other than just say start talking and we'll, um, if we have two or three at once, we'll, we'll cut you off and just let one at a time talk. So um, does anybody have any questions or um, anything they'd like to ask? People are trying to figure out your mute and on and off kinds of things, so we'll give it a few minutes here and see. Hi, this is Sarah. I'm actually uh, Josh's wife. Um, we were both on the call. Um, our daughter is five months old, and I am sorry we were um, trying to do a little bedtime here too, but my question was more about um, the effect, so I may have missed this, but um, the effects of music on uh, kids who have hearing loss. Um, there are there's so much research out there right now, um, but it's all good. It's all good. That's mm -hmm. what that's what's really great about it is that any time that we introduce music, uh, the brain responds in a positive way. Any time we provide rhythmic activities, whether it's auditorily or motorically, whether we're listening to it or whether we're moving to it. Um, it stimulates the brain to improve cognition and memory skills. 
Um, at the beginning, I explained that we used a lot of music initially to get better um, rhythmic patterns with speech um, so that the kids didn't have uh, as much of a robotic type sound with some of the speech patterns. We were able to uh, introduce the, the rhythm patterns to that speech and get that to flow um, more smoothly. It also helps with um, developing a, a better uh, flow for those that sign or cue. Um, so the motor skill along with the auditory, um, it's just a win-win situation. Thank that you so much. That does. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. I have a question about um, my daughter's five, and she has bilateral implants. And she seems like she has a really good ear for music. Like she just, you know, the beat and everything. She just kind of gets it. Like she wants to play piano, and everybody keeps telling me she's too small because she can't touch the pedals and all that. So we'll probably start on a keyboard or something. But my question is, I guess, just has there been any research or studies done to see if that's just uh, part of her nature, hearing loss uh, set aside, you know what I mean? Or do the kids typically have, you know, a better ear sometimes because of the technology? Does that make sense? I am, I think I know what you're saying. Um, go back a couple decades when we were very into looking at children as visual learners or auditory learners or tactile learners, and one of the things that came up was, well, children with hearing loss can't be auditory learners, when in fact, we found that many individuals that had hearing loss were actually auditory learners and learned better auditorily than they did visually or tactilely. Um, so it's not an automatic OG when the ears aren't quite functioning at the same level, we automatically go to visual. That's not necessarily the case. Um, and we have people that have great hearing and have two left feet when it comes to dancing, and we have people that are profoundly deaf that are phenomenal dancers and able to keep the rhythm and keep the beat. So um, ears may or may not actually play a key in how well we are able to do those things. If your daughter is showing an interest in music, at, at five years of age, they are not too little to start um, exploring instruments and taking some lessons, n never to the point of being a stressful thing, but um, five-year-old is, is, is fine to start um, playing keyboard and m maybe a small electrical, um, sit it on her lap and start to learn um, and follow the keys and have her listen. Um, to what she plays, but um, she's definitely not too young to start, and that's great if she has um, a tendency or an interest um, in that, by all means, let her explore that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi, Nancy. Um, my son is 15 months, and we take a music class that you had mentioned um, earlier together with one of my other children. And I was just wondering if there was anything that I could do to help um, improve his experience during the class. Okay. The first thing that I would do is how is the music being presented? In terms of? Are they... Um, playing a cassette player or CD player, are they, how, is the music class one where there's the background music and then all of the children are, like I was describing, are playing rhythm sticks or are... Yeah, it was a lot of what you were describing as far as scarves and sticks and shakers and drums and they do play the cassette sometimes. I mean, we're all, always, the adults are always singing and doing, um, you know, all the songs. We have the CDs at home and in the car that all the, you know, the children all know the songs at this point, and the adults 
have heard the song a million times, so More we all know the song. Mean, yeah. More times than you care to mention. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, make sure that he's having access to that, your 15-month-old. Right. Um, again, tactually, auditorily, um, make sure that he is getting that background um, music, whether it's Okay, he's going to sit with his hand on the speaker and watch the rest of them wave the scarves while he's feeling that rhythm, while you may be tapping that rhythm on his shoulder, on his back, um, on his lap, um, assisting not by doing with the scarf or doing with the musical instrument, but by providing him with um, tactile input as well as to the rhythmic pattern of whatever it is that they are um, doing. Okay, you great. What I'm saying? Yeah, don't do it for him. Let him still do the experience, but assist him with feeling that beat. Um, again, by either feeling the speaker from where that music is coming from for a portion to kind of get it started, and then you um, giving him a, a, a tactile um, beat as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh huh. Anybody else out there? Well, I hope. It, go ahead. No, I, I. I'm just thinking that that might be it for the comments tonight. Well, I hope that I encouraged you to not be afraid to explore rhythm and music and dance for your kids because it's fun. It's something they can participate in. Do not hesitate to um, involve them in anything along those lines, you will see through their own expression, through their participation, that it is something that they um, enjoy and can participate in. And it makes their brain happy. And we like happy brains. <laughs> so I hope this has been helpful. Um, thanks for having me, and I'll let Terry do whatever closing things she needs to do. Excellent. I'm going to stop the recording. Excellent. Thank you all for 